we want to explore the declarative nature of uh, XPROC 3.0, explicitly 3.0. So um, how, how did we get this ID? Well, um, um, put two people back, uh, put two people together in a car returning from XML Prague, where they've heard about the declarative nature of uh, Schematron and XSLT. Um, then you start wondering, um, is or is XPROC 3.0 a um, declarative language? Um, so that's the exploration. Uh, um, and the, that's where the talk comes from. Um, um, who are we? Um, Achim Berenson is the uh, um, the head of uh, the uh, XML project company that um, brought us uh, or brings us uh, Morgana XPROC, um, XPROC processor. And uh, I'm Geert Bormans, an uh, independent consultant currently working for the Swiss government. Um, and I think it's fair to say that um, uh, XPROC 3.0 has um, uh, played a central role in our professional, in both our professional lives for, uh, for the past few years now. Um, we have no ambition um, to be scientific. Um, so it's uh, more like, as the title says, an exploration. And this is how we are going to um, explore um, this declarative nature. Um, first, um, Achim will uh, um, spend some time explaining uh, what, what, what we see as, uh, um, or how we define uh, in this particular context, uh, what declarative is. And then we'll have a, a quick look at XPROC 3.0 challenge, um, introduction to XPROC in less than five minutes. Then um, we'll go about the uh, declarative aspects of uh, XPROC3, and we will conclude with some uh, takeaways, we, uh, we hope. Floor to your uh, Achim. Yep. Okay, um, first let's make clear what we me uh, mean by declarative. As Gerd said, uh, this is not a computer science lecture or a scientific lecture. Um, we want to concentrate on practical aspects. So what we want to do is um, we have two bags there. There's the bag of declarative language. And typically in the discussion, the other bag is called imperative language. And we want to know what do uh, we do with this piece of paper where XPROC 3.0 stands. Does it go into the declarative language bag or the imperative language bag? The next slide will show you uh, some of the typical um, sorry, of the typical uh, uh, containment in the uh, imperative slides. It's Java, it's Fortran, it's basic, it's C. I think this is undisputed. And in um, the declarative language slide, uh, we, there's uh, typically the typical candidates to be there is uh, XSLT and Haskell, Prolog, SQL, Xforms and some other uh, languages, and some of them are disputed, but uh, just to give you an idea uh, what we're talking about. So the question is, what do we do with the XPROC 3.0 um, card? Where do we uh, th throw it? So we need some criteria to know whether the, it, we put it in the declarative back or the imperative back. To do this, we turn to Wikipedia and said, okay, let's look what Wikipedia says, uh, what a declarative language is. It says declarative programming is a programming paradigm, a paradigm, sorry, that expresses the logic of a computation without describing its control flow. It's a high level program that describes what a computation should perform. Any programming language that lack of, lacks of side effects and a language with a clear correspondence to mathematical logic. The last thing is uh, clearly too restrictive for XPROC 3.0, but we found three things um, we highlighted on the next slides. The first one is uh, an XPROC program um, expresses the logic of computation without describing a control flow. It describes what computation should perform in opposition to the computation itself, and it has no uh, side effects. So three criteria. We see on the next slide, and we will check this in the third part for of this talk, whether it applies or does not apply to XPROC 3.0.
I shortly talk about the three aspects to give you, uh, to have some mutual understanding what we mean by this. First of all, side effects or no side effects. Typically, uh, a piece of software is said to have side effects. A piece of software may be a function or a procedure, whatever you call it, uh, is said to have side effects if it uh, cannot only operate on its local variables, but also on uh, global variables and external states like the hard disk drive or um, some other um, uh, um, external uh, uh, devices. Basic problem of uh, side effects is that it makes software um, hard to maintain, hard to debug, because you have to imagine not only one piece of software interacting with a global variable, but more than one. And if my uh, piece of software changes the glob global variable, your piece of software may expect another state and the same for external states. So excluding side effects by design of a program language is said to make programming easier, uh, to make debugging easier and to allow uh, better implementations. One aspect we in the XML community all know, um, the, uh, the way to um, hide side effects is the deterministic function of XPath. That means that whenever you call an XPath function inside an XSLT template or so with the same parameters, you get the same results. Not uh, regarding uh, or not uh, relating to what has changed in the world. This is something uh, sometimes annoying if you call uh, the XPath function current daytime uh, during the same style sheet, you will always get the same results because uh, this is uh, how the language is built to um, get away of side effects. Next one is uh, flow control. I think on the left side, there's a typical flow control. Um, I learned this flow controls in the uh, late 70s when I, uh, early 80s, when I started uh, to learn programming in schools. And this is something which is easy. Um, the program starts, then comes an instruction A, and then come, uh, comes a, um, a conditional instruction with is either true, and then it goes to D and C and back to B, or is false, uh, then it goes to the end of the programs. This is something which is typically for imperative languages, and at least for the three or four first imperative languages I learned, they are diff just different ways to express these control flows. If you know basic, you know that the B will be a if with a go to the end. If uh, you then write it in Pascal, uh, you have a while um, instruction, but there's just different notations around the control flow. Declarative languages on the other side try to avoid flow controls. They use other notations to describe the algorithm or to describe the uh, output like first order, order logic or relational algebra, uh, function calculus, or you might even uh, use graphical systems uh, uh, with uh, graphic notations to uh, describe what you want. The computer, however, needs something like a flow control because this is what computers are built. And uh, this is part of the implementation of the language to figure out the flow control for themselves. So declarative language have no, typically are not expressed in a flow control. And the third criteria we used, uh, we like to talk about is on the next slide. It's describe what a computation should perform. This means declarative programming is more describing the results of a computation than actually listing the commands and steps that must be performed. And the results can be described in different languages. They could be described even in natural language or in domain-specific expert languages. And again, the translation into the computer language, the language the computer understands is done by implementation. So uh, the opposition we have here is describing the result is declarative while describing the, uh, the implementation of the computation um, or the steps to achieve the result is uh, more on the imperative sides. However, I think there's a continuum um, because describing um, steps to archive results is also a part in our natural language and in expert language. And there are some level of abstractions 
Um, for the short time we have, I just try to uh, spell it out in the, uh, in the next slide with a simple example from, uh, from the cooking world. Um, you could describe, you could tell an experienced cook, uh, please prepare a lasagna. And this is a high level abstraction of telling him what to do, not describing the results, but telling him what to do. If the cook is not that experienced because he doesn't know what a lasagna is, but knows what a bolognese is, um, the three-step uh, code of action would work. Prepare a bolognese and a bechamel. And if the cook is even not that experienced, but is a beginner, uh, you hand them the longer recipe with all the detailed steps to uh, do a lasagna from a, a beginner's cookbook. And if we imagine uh, a cooking uh, robot uh, and have to write down the cooking robot program for a lasagna, it will be even longer and even more detailed in each step. So these are the three steps, uh, the three aspects we would uh, like to talk about. But before this, uh, we need a short introduction to Xproct. So back to Gerd. Thanks, uh, Achim. So, um, so yes, uh, very, very quickly, uh, what's uh, Xproc? Um, well, we're talking about Xproc tree. Uh, if I don't mention the tree explicitly, and that's what I mean. Um, so it's a, a programming language, and um, the syntax is XML based. Uh, basically, it's a uh, um, it's a specification that tells us or, or allows us to um, to describe the operations. Um, a sweet sequence of uh, operations even uh, um, to be performed on documents, documents not explicitly um, uh, or, or not limited to uh, XML documents at, uh, at all, um, just to be precise there. Um, and that's uh, well, a sequence of uh, operations. It's an expression in uh, what we call pipelines. Just mentioning it's a, uh, um, there is a formal specification that published um, um, in September, I think, of this year, and it's a it's a W3C community group report. So uh, it uh, specification comes from a, a community group effort. Um, just um, to make sure we uh, we have the same uh, understanding of some concepts. Here is a um, uh, very simple linear Xproc pipeline. It has uh, so. The, the entire thing is a pipeline and the pipeline consists of uh, a sequence of steps and these uh, steps uh, basically the first transform happens on the uh, on the source document the second transform happens on the result of the first uh, transform and the result of that transformation is uh, what we consider the uh, the result document um, a um, uh, this is a functional flow a more um, technical view on the uh, on on the same um, pipeline execution or on the same pipeline is there's a source doc. We've got um, all sorts of uh, operational steps um, predefined. Um, PXSLT is one of uh, those steps, and there are things that go in the step, and there are things that come out of the step. These are uh, input and uh, output ports. And um, we put them in the diagram as, uh, as small boxes. So, you know, an, uh, an XSLT requires um, an, uh, an input uh, and a style sheet. And then um, after the uh, XSLT uh, transformation execution, you get some result. Um, I've shown the uh, interim results on the uh, um slide or, or in the drawing but whether you want to do something with it or not that's uh, that's up to you um basically the green arrow um, how you have to um interpret that is um there is a flow basically going from the source through the uh, through the pipeline execution to the result and um, most of those uh, in, in this example are considered uh, um, primary both in and out so you don't have to define um, the step knows that if something comes in um, that's the document you want to uh, want to process if you want to see some code there's a um, um, th this is a step declaration this basically is our pipeline but um, as one person's uh, pipeline is another or might be another person uh, or, or in another context might be a step um, we declare all pipelines uh, as steps there's an input, there's an output, and all 
that happens in this uh, in this XPROC pipeline is a uh, is a sequence of uh, two XSLTs, and that's um, that's all there is uh, uh, to it. Other than um, if you get the impression that all you can do is uh, build linear pipelines, um, that's not the case. You can build rather complex pipelines. So I have a, a somewhat more evolved example here. Um, source, doc source documents comes in. Um, two transforms happens uh, basically on the same source document. And uh, after the transformation, not the not necessarily after, but the two transformation results both get packed um, together in, in one container, uh, which has a uh, wrapping element and returns a uh, result document uh, to us. A somewhat more evolved example on, from a technical point of view, it's, uh, it's just an elaboration. The, um, as you can see, the PPEC step has a primary port where the input comes in, but it also has a alternate port. It's not a very common, common step actually, but we used it here in the example because it's one of the uh, standard steps that has both a primary port and an uh, alternative port, uh, both considered as an input source. Uh, just briefly the core, the code. Um, I hope you can see the colors um, because basically there is now two pipelines in there. Um, there's not just one primary pipeline. So I made the, gro the green. Um, as you can see, we have now steps with uh, names. Um, the identity uh, at the beginning is just a, a transparent um, step. Um, it's just to give what comes in uh, in the step to give it a name so we can reference it later. The first step in the the, the first step after the identity is a uh, is a transformer. It's the second transformer. So the transformation result of the blue line transformer is a uh, TFX2. Um, then we recall the uh, the original source. Um, so we have an identity again. And then basically we just have the uh, green line one step after the other without references, unless at the end we have to reference the uh, the altern alternative uh, or alternate uh, uh, port again to uh, pick up the result from the uh, uh, style sheet two transformation. Um, so there's some complexity in there. Um, I'm not going to expand too much on it, but uh, just just showing that um, um, it's it's pretty easy to, uh, to build more complex uh, pipelines than just linear ones. Um, so um, if you're hungry for more, um, there's a community group, um, as I said, so there's a reference in the middle. There's uh, formal specifications for both the XPROC language and the, uh, and the standard step library. That's much more than uh, XSLT and packaging. Uh, there's a mailing list for uh, questions and there's quite a bit of introduction information um, on the xproc.org website. Um, go there for articles and also for references uh, to the XProc 3.0 book written by uh, Eric Siegel. Um, and as for implementations, um, th th this slide just lists the implementations with uh, published test results. Um, so there is a test suit. The reference is at the bottom. There's a Morgana XProc that is now that now has a 100% uh, test coverage, um, and you can safely say it's a it's a production product now, um, 1.0, and Calabash is uh, um, on the way, um, pretty close to uh, to uh, being finished, uh, if I understand well. Okay, so um, Achim, back to you. So having seen a bit of XPROC, uh, now let's check, come back to the question or the declarative aspects. We want to check whether XPROC has no side effects, no flow control, and is able to describe the uh, computation without uh, giving steps. First up, side effects. The next slide, please. I'm sorry. Well, XPROC has a lot of side effects. So uh, if you look at the step library, you find steps uh, named pstore, phdp request, pfile delete. I think from the naming, you get the idea what the step do, and they produce global side effects. Uh, this is because Xbox was designed to be a workflow language 
which um, can map the, uh, the workflow, um, which includes store a document, uh, send a document to web server, um, pack, uh, create a folder, put documents in it, and then zip, uh, zip the folder or something like this. So uh, on the step base, Xbox is uh, clearly uh, producing external side effects. And Xbox is it doesn't even prevent steps from consuming external side effects of other steps. Um, so one step could store a, a document at a given URI and the later step might load uh, this document uh, giving the same URI. Uh, I would always consider this bad programming style, but it's not built in, it's not no, uh, no restriction to do this built into the language. And the third thing about side effects is that um, Xbox is much more relaxed about uh, deterministic XPath functions than, say, XSLT. In XSLT, um, the whole style sheet is the execution context for an XPath uh, function. So the result of the function will never change. Um, Xbox doesn't have this. So if you call um, uh, current date time on different steps, you will get. Uh, different results, not always the results you expected, but time flows in an Xbox pipeline uh, as uh, in opposition to an XSLT uh, start sheet. So we have external side effects. What about global side effects? What about global variables? Uh, this is on the next slide. Um, there is no way to change the global uh, state uh, or the state of a global variable in Xproc. We have global variables, but they are immutable. What is sometimes confusing is, uh, on the other side, it's very handy, is that you can declare a new variable with a new scope, which shares the same name as the global variable. Um, and as soon as you leave the scope, um, the old variable uh, comes back with the old value. To demonstrate this, uh, just a sh two short pieces of code on the next slide. Um, the first is in typical imperative language. Uh, we uh, assign four to a variable, then we iterate two times. So the, in the, on the first iteration, var becomes five. And if it, the, we leave the block, var is six. Surprisingly, it's not six in uh, Xproc three because we do not have globe. Uh, we cannot shed, uh, change the state of a global variable. So in Xproc, it's uh, all inside the block. There's a new variable declared, and it has a value five all the time. And once the block leaves, the variable uh, disappears, and the uh, uh, global variable var comes back, and its value stays four as it was before. So we have. External side effects, yes, but we do not have global side effects in uh, Xproc. So the question is Xproc declarative. Uh, we said it's one one. Next aspect uh, is on the next slide. We talk about flow control, and we had this distinction that imperative language have flow control and declarative language do not have flow control. Now, what about Xproc? If you um, search a bit on the internet, you might find this uh, a quote from our friends at data to type and they say Xproc is a programming language or a language in XML, which provides a set of commands for flow control in order to generate XML oriented workflows. So they say Xproc defines a flow control. And if we say flow control is imperative, the case is closed here. I don't dispute the quote from data to type, they are right, but I think we have to keep in mind that there are two different concepts of flow control here. And I try to explain them on the next slide. On the left side, you see an, X, an Xproc uh, pipeline. What is important here is the right side. We have a flow control and this flow control says, uh, okay, whatever document comes in, it goes to a validate. And uh, after it leaves the validate, the flow branches. So one result goes to the transform and then to the store. 
and the other goes to another transform and XSLFO and a store too. So we have here flow control, but remember this is not a flow control as we talked about imperative language because the branching that the result of a step goes to uh, two different steps is uh, something uh, which is a graph and not a flow control in the original sense of uh, being an imperative language. Next slide, please. What is important to keep in mind is that Xproc is a flow control language or expresses a flow, but the, X, the flow is not the execution order of the step as it was with imperative languages. What an Xproc pipeline does or what the con connections between the pipeline do is they restrict execution order, but they do not determine ex uh, execution order. If you look at the flow on the left side, you can say that the first thing an implementation has to do is to do the validate, but then it can do either transform one or transform two. And if it has tra done transform one, it can then either do transform two or store two. So any connect, any implementation strategy that is compatible with the connections will serve um, will be fine for the Xproc processor. So what an Xproc pipeline does is just restricting flow control, not defining a flow control. And this uh, is a double meaning of the concept of flow control. The actual flow control is uh, um, determined by the Xproc engine itself or the implementation itself. And it's free to choose any variation with uh, which is compatible with the uh, restricted execution order. And it might even, uh, if you have a two core machine, do the things uh, in parallel um, as uh, my uh, Xproc implementation does. Once the p-validate is passed, it splits up into threads and the two threads uh, run in parallel using two different kernels of your machine. So here again, uh, we have an execution plan, but the execution plan for the processor is uh, up to the um, Xproc machine. And so I would say uh, no flow control um, is given in the sense that we needed to determine the declarative aspects of Xproc. Gert? Sorry. I was on mute. So um, I see that we're eating in the uh, question time. So uh, well, basically the third point, um, uh, describe what the computation should perform. Um, just referencing to the um, lasagna um, analogy that uh, um, uh, Achim had before, but uh, I'm sorry for those uh, looking for a cooking robot. That's not what we built, uh, but we built something else on a level where uh, where we don't have little information about, and that's less common than just do some XSLT transformations. We um, we did build a um, um, a audio MIDI file transformer or converter to um, to PDF scores, um, and um, we're doing so in two steps, um, converting the uh, MIDI file to a uh, music XML and then using the same library, um, not, not doing it with uh, XSLFO or anything, but using the same library that basically uh, transform anything music related that comes into a, to a PDF score. Um, in the background, we're using MuseScore for that. Um, so here's some code just quickly. Um, we have our own library, which has which declares a, a custom step convert score with a mandatory content type, which is um, which just says like on the first step we wanted to um, to transform the uh, the audio MIDI to an uh, to an application XML, and in the second step uh, create a PDF score. Um, here's the um, the declaration of uh, um, here's the declaration of the uh, step. And the score comes too fast. Sorry about that. Um, and as you can see, so sorry for those who want to test this at home. Um, there's an extension uh, uh, class attribute on the step, calling a uh, calling a custom step actually. Um, for those wanting to see, so it's dueling banjos. I found um, as a MIDI file and looking at the um, obscure rhythms. Sometimes I think. Uh, 
I understood this really was played with MIDI instruments. Um, uh, so the MIDI file was not extracted from scores, but uh, was was really played. And uh, we're transforming this into uh, into um, into score PDF. Um, let me bring the slides back. Um, but um, just can we now chunk something in without really start programming? Can we chunk a step in that basically reduces the score? Um, let me uh, let me at least uh, um, just run something. Um, now, let me first uh, show the code. Um, here's the code. Um, we've got the, true, the two converters again, and right in the middle, I chunked a uh, XSLT because in music XML, it's pretty straightforward to um, to filter out any instruments you don't want to see in the reduction. Uh, so, so I do that there, passing a parameter saying I only want to see the P1 and the P2 instruments. Um, bottom line, we could have asked MuseScore, so just make a third call to the same library, ask MuseScore to do the filtering. Um, basically, the point was, um, what do we want? What level of abstraction we want? And we're free to choose there. So uh, what well, appeared kind of interesting to me, um, just make sure that there's something to run here. Um, I'm running the pipeline that actually does that. And then I hope to... Uh, um, so I only run it. I only ran this one in the interest of time. Um, we should. We've seen the score here, and uh, at some point, I hope that the reduced score will uh, will appear as well. Um, let me uh, let me briefly. Uh, I'll show you the reduced score uh, after. Um, let me briefly uh, just give you the uh, the takeaways. Um, as Achim said, there's a one-to-one, -one, um, yes, no, on the uh, side effects. Um, but I think at least our interpretation of declarative is that um, since we have no flow control and we have an interesting level of uh, abstraction, um, uh, as, when we describe what the computation should do um, and leave the rest to, um, um, to the processor behind it, I think we score well there. Um, so it's least... <laughs> I know it's not scientific, but it was at least our um, interpretation. Uh, we can now make the claim that XProc 3.0 is a uh, declarative language. Um, so why not? Um, <laughs> why this talk? Um, well, um, we were tempted to say that XProc is it's uh, it's common fashion, no? So we were tempted to say that XProc is a uh, uh, declarative programming language. At least we did some research now, uh, um, be it very modestly, uh, um, to, to prove that point, or at least have a reference to say, yeah, yeah, there is some uh, declarative aspects to XProc3. Um, and we always read that um, declarative languages uh, are easy to learn and help you solve problems in a shorter amount of time. So we now have some sort of a, a handle to that claim. Um, I think just briefly, yes, the uh, reduced score is ready. Um, as the band is in quarantine and only the uh, um, the melody instruments can go for the gig tonight, um, here's the score without uh, with some some of the stuff uh, some of the band members uh, filtered out. Nothing fancy. Just um, sorry, it's not a cooking robot, uh, Thomas. Um, and where's my slides again? Okay, that's it, thank you.